uh, cathedral choristers. So a huge mix, really, of backgrounds. But um, hopefully I've got something useful to say today if you've got a question you want to ask. Fantastic. And Duncan, where are you? I need you to unmute. I've now lost you. <laughs> I'm unmuted and ready to go. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Duncan Rock. Uh, I have, I guess, concurrent lives as an opera singer and a nutritionist. I, as a singer, I studied at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama back in what feels like 1912. I think I graduated 2010. And since then, I've had a 10 year career, mainly as an opera singer. I've sung roles at places like the Metropolitan Opera in New York, the Royal, the Royal Opera House here in London, Glyndebourne, English National Opera, Teatro Real, sort of the sort of opera circuit that, that one, if you're lucky enough, you, you get to do. Um, Concurrently with this, I uh, own and operate a nutrition consultancy uh, uh, business, um, primarily online at the moment. And um, about six months ago, these worlds collided when uh, Stephen King from the Voice Care Center in London got in touch and asked me if I'd like to do some work specifically on nutrition for vocal health and performers. And I jumped at the opportunity and that's how I met the lovely Ginevra. And um, yeah, it's been quite, a, quite a, uh, an interesting journey into this very specific, quite niche world of nutrition for, for vocal health. But um, I'm loving it and I'd love to take any questions uh, you guys have on, uh, on that field specifically. Fantastic, thank you. Ginevra, you look like you're about to say something. So I no, I was just going to wonder whether we had any any question to start with. Well, it looks like the chat is already going mad. I'm going to do my best to keep up, but Ginevra and Duncan, if you do want to have the chat open in front and if you see any really worthwhile talking points that you like, uh, that's great. Now, the first one I saw, let's let's start with a, a slightly simple one, but this, this will be something that everybody's interested in. Uh, from Mike. Why is my voice better later in the day? And I wonder if you could just talk about how the voice changes through the day as well. Various reasons for that. Um, when we wake up in the morning, everything is a bit stiff. You know, our joints don't move as well. And the older you get, the stiffer you are when you wake in the morning. So you have to get things moving. You have to warm up your body and you have to do the same with your voice because our voice is made of cartilages and muscles and joints and ligaments and moving parts just the same as any other bit of our body. So that's one reason. Another reason is that when you're asleep, lying horizontal, all the fluid in your body sort of dissipates evenly throughout your body so that the top end gets a little bit more fluid in it. And then as you go through the day, upright, the fluid gradually drops down. So some people more notice their ankles swell up slightly at the end of the day. So that's got to come from somewhere. <laughs> and it means that the, the uh, vocal folds, which are at the top end of the body, are slightly more full of fluid at the beginning and less full of fluid at the end. So they're going to be more mobile as you go through the day. Now it's a tiny, tiny amount, but when you're a singer, a tiny amount can make a difference. Uh, and the third reason might be to do with what you have in your stomach when you go to sleep at night. And Duncan might be able to talk about this one. Geneva, I'm so sorry. I got so entranced in these wonderful questions that I, can you, what, what would you want me to <laughs> elaborate? I'm so We're sorry. talking about why your voice is better in the later on in the day. And I've talked about uh, vocal fold edema during as a result of, of sleeping. Um, I've talked about just general mobility issues, but I wonder whether you might be able to address what people have in their stomach when they go to sleep and how that might affect their voice first thing in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, anecdotally speaking, I notice uh, clients I have who suffer from any sort of reflux disorder or gastroesophageal reflux disease, which I often refer to as GERD, tend to experience it more prominently in the morning. And it uh, sort of relates to what Ginevra was saying. We tend to, um, as we lie horizontally, the, uh, the contents of our stomach 
can reflux more readily up the esophagus uh, than when we're horizontal. This is really crude. It's basically due to simple gravity. If you're horizontal, liquid can travel more readily on a horizontal plane than on a vertical plane, simply due to gravity. Two very simple mechanisms I have found um, can yield really uh, significant results in this regard. The first is just sleeping with your head slightly more elevated. So if this side is my head and this side is my feet, if I just elevate slightly, obviously gravity will help the, the uh, will impede this, the uh, reflux contents coming up the esophagus. And the other uh, very useful thing is lying on your left side, which I know may sound a little strange, but it's because the esophagus actually connects to the stomach on the right side. So this is my right side, this is my left side. If I'm lying on my left, the, uh, the contents of the stomach will, through gravity, sit further away from the esophagus uh, than if I'm lying on my right side. Um, so that may, may be one reason that people experience sort of that more froggy, hoarse, I don't know, slightly more raspy uh, feeling in the morning. But to be honest, anecdotally speaking, uh, I just find warming up my whole body is the best way of warming up my voice. And obviously, towards the end of the day, you, you've walked, you've talked, you may have, I don't know, gone for a jog, gone to the gym, done a yoga class, whatever. So just through the simple act of warming up your body systemically, uh, this can be a fantastic mechanism for warming up specifically your voice. Great. That's, uh, I'm glad to glad that I sleep on the left. That helps at least a little bit. <laughs> um, that, that, in fact, Duncan, leads really nicely. A, a lot of people asking about very uh, diet-specific things here. Um, Jackie Hart has asked about recommendations uh, for what to eat, especially to keep energy levels up, which leads to uh, what Cindy has asked about, what, what can exacerbate that acid reflux um, or that feeling of kind of cloggy throat? Sure. Um, this is a, a very difficult uh, question to answer for 200 odd people, unfortunately. Um, I'm not trying to, it's, I, I know it might sound like a cop out, but uh, you know, I wanna give you honest answers. This is because the issue of reflux is massively subject to inter-individual variability. So what that means is something that exacerbates reflux in me may actually reduce reflux in you and vice versa. Um, I've noticed this anecdotally with my clients and with myself, and this is also what we know from the clinical research. Now, that being said, there are two major culprits that seem to be fairly consistent in the research. And I'm sorry, it's all the fun stuff. Sugar is, tends to be a very consistent um, exacerbator of reflux, both in terms of the, um, the amount of reflux and also the intensity uh, of the reflux. It, it actually, we know fairly conclusively that particularly sugar can be um, the cause of um, uh, reflux laryngitis, which is obviously a very significant issue for any singer. And then alcohol. Uh, it's actually not quite as conclusive as sugar, but alcohol consumption, particularly when we consume alcohol normally, which is late in the evening, can be a pretty consistent exacerbator of symptoms. Um, a lot of other things you'll hear bandied about, things like caffeine, acidic drinks, spicy foods, dairy, uh, you know, you'll hear all sorts of things. They may or may not be um, causes of any disorder. I mean, if there was, if people had any specific questions on specific foods, I'd happily go into detail, but the general answer for reflux is watch out for your alcohol, watch out for your sugar, try those sleeping tips that I just outlined earlier, um, and then just um, be mindful. Uh, be mindful if you eat, if you notice 
you uh, experience an exacerbation in your symptoms consistently with one food, then for you, that food is likely, um, is likely a factor. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, now, I, I'm loving all of these questions here. So uh, both of you, if you do see things you'd like to jump on, by all means, I'm taking I, some screenshots, however, as I go. I have one I'd love to answer because it's, it's a, being Australian, it's, a, it's something very close to my heart. Jane Newcastle, you wrote at 6.08, um, is caffeine really, really dreadful or can I continue my two coffees a day? That Jane, was one of my screenshots, entirely selfishly as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is no consistent evidence to suggest that caffeine is bad for your vocal mechanism. Um, now, that being said, caffeine can be an exacerbator of reflux in some individuals, but it's certainly not. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it's a sort of unfairly maligned um, victim of this uh, of this conversation. Um, it will not dehydrate you, as I've been told for. 15 years by singing teachers. All um, fluid containing foods and drinks, except alcohol, contribute to your daily fluid intake. So, and caffeine, uh, so coffee, tea, even, you know, I wouldn't recommend you drink them, but even uh, fizzy drinks, soft drinks with, with, with caffeine, they, they will not dehydrate you uh, more than the fluid they provide to your system. So, uh, Jane, please continue enjoying your two coffees a day. And I, I, I invite you to, yeah, continue enjoying that. That certainly makes me feel better about my morning coffee as well. I'm an espresso nut at the moment. I think lockdown has increased espresso and wine, unfortunately. Um, this one, I think, Ginevra, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand to you because I know you've talked a little bit about this um, in a, in a lecture of yours that I came and saw once. Um, this is from Marjorie Neri, um, talking about, do vocal cords become less mobile and flexible with age? Um, this is a really fascinating question. I know lots of people have, have asked this in, in drop-ins as well. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this. Well, the vocal cords are made of muscle primarily. And um, the muscle is moved or moves uh, with cartilages around it. So like any part of the body, it will be affected by aging. So what happens to our muscles in our bodies as we get older, they get weaker, okay? They get significantly weaker if we don't use them. If we carry on using them, they remain relatively strong. So if you keep working out, yeah, your body will stay relatively strong. If you keep walking, if you keep running, if you keep moving about, then you, the effects of aging will be reduced. You will still age. I'm really sorry, but you will, you know, carry on getting older and eventually we all, you know, finish. But we can make the journey more pleasant. Yeah. And keep singing. So the really important thing is to keep working those muscles. And it's not just singing. We work them by speaking as well. And if you are an older person and you live alone, you may well speak far less during the day. And this is something that, it, that a lot of people find after retirement, for example, that they may have come, been in a job where they do a lot of talking and then they're at home and they're not talking as much and the muscles get weaker. So there are ways that you can work the muscles. You can read out loud. You can talk to yourself. You can talk to your plants. You can talk to your dog. You can sing along to the radio you can just keep that voice working um, and it's not just muscles the the nerve supply to the muscles will also um, die off slightly and again the more you use it the less that will happen um, and that is why older voices will be less responsive they will be less quick to do things like pitch jumps or fast notes and the vibrato rate will often slow down. And that slowing in response is purely due to the nerve, the nerves just dying away. So keep using it, keep doing it. 
And if it's got weak because you've been ill or because you haven't been using it, you can rebuild that strength. You can get it back again. Yep. So so voice, the kind of voice rehabilitation I do is like physiotherapy for the voice. And we do exercises and we get it going. And there's a lot of ways. Some of the best exercises you can do for getting your your voice going again, if it's been through problems or you've you've had an illness, are singing or uh, making a sound down a straw. I've got a straw here handy. All right. And you can put your straw into a glass of water. Yep. And you can hear I'm singing into the straw and the water is bubbling up and that bubbling water is giving me a little bit of resistance for the vocal folds. So that's that's very useful sort of um, an air pressure feedback. But also the bubbles themselves are a massage because that's fluctuating air pressure coming back on the vocal folds. So if you slide through your vocal range into a straw in water, you will be stretching and massaging your vocal folds. And stretch and massage is a very good way to reduce inflammation. So there's another, another we're on to another topic now of vocal fatigue. If your voice is really tired, do that singing gently through your range into a straw in water and that will actually reduce the inflammation of your vocal folds. Brilliant, thank you. And just thinking a little bit about vocal fatigue, of course this is something that we all need to listen a little bit to our voices, certainly when we're talking, spending a lot of the day talking over Zoom. I know uh, stay-at-home members, I know lots of you um, are teachers, you spend your day talking um, and it seems even harder over Zoom. I'm not entirely sure why yet. I haven't figured that out myself. Um, how would you talk about um, what we need to sort of pay attention to if we are feeling like we get really tired at the end of the rehearsal and our voice is painful or we're getting hoarse or um, how can, what, what things do we need to pay attention to? Okay, great question. Um, our vocal folds are the, the as I said, they're muscles, they're covered in membrane, and they are incredibly good at repairing themselves. All right, they are very, very good at, at sorting themselves out, but they get a hell of a bashing. All right, so if you think about clapping your hands together, I mean, you can all do this, you're on Zoom. If you clap your hands together lots of times, yeah, you open your hands up again, and they're a bit tingly, yeah, and they might feel hot. Now, my vocal folds at the moment are colliding about 200 times a second. That's a lot of collisions. Right? And if I'm talking to you nonstop, that is going on. Those collisions are going on the whole time. If I'm singing, I sing at a higher pitch than that. So that will, be, will increase the frequency. So they will be colliding more often. So we can think of what we call vocal loading, which is the amount of impact on the larynx and that will increase with the amount of use so the number of hours per day that you're using your voice uh, and also the level of use so the louder you are the greater the impact because they're literally clapping together harder so loud si singing or speaking will increase your vocal loading and increase the potential for the voice getting tired yeah. The, the third factor that will always have an impact is anxiety. If you are worried about things, then your vocal loading will increase. Uh, and I know it's impossible to stop worrying sometimes. I mean, <laughs> it's all very well to say, but just be aware of it. So if you know you're going through a tough time or you know you've got a bit of a worry or you're anxious about something, just know that your voice will be a little bit more vulnerable and you've just got to be a bit nicer to yourself. Now, to be nicer to yourself, you might give yourself more frequent rests. And we know also some very, very useful research done on school teachers and their voice use over a, a long period of time that their voices recover more effectively 
if their rest time is in lots and lots of short chunks. So frequent rest, voice rest, is more use than one long one, even if it adds up to the same amount of time. So if you've got a one hour rehearsal, yeah, and you've got 20 minutes of that you're not singing, make that 21 minute rests rather than one 20 minute rest. And then your voice will recover more quickly. So lots of frequent rest times. And this is really, really useful to remember for your own voice use, but also when you are, if you're a teacher and you're in the classroom, that you build in lots of little mini rest times for yourself. If you are a choral conductor and you're taking a rehearsal, make sure that each voice part gets lots of mini rests. Um, and your own voice, if you are taking a rehearsal, make sure that you rest lots of times in between. Don't sing along with everybody. <laughs> so there's all sorts of things that you can do to help give your voice that recovery time um, and then again, inflammation reduces, the cells on the surface regenerate very quickly, and we've got a back to a healthy voice again. Great. And and what would be a, I can see a few people asking in the chat, as far as, you know, when when do we rest? You know, of course, we, we do need vocal rest. What What is a good time period? Is it, or, or is there something we need to be really paying attention to, to say, okay, I'm in need, I need to rest now? What, what, what are good indicators for that? Well, indicators of your voice getting tired would be change in the quality. So um, a little bit hoarse, a bit husky, a little bit breathy. Um, not being able to sing quietly is one, or not being able to sing loudly is another. So, so the sort of extremes of control will be more difficult. And another thing will be perhaps a delayed onset. So when you start the sound, you can hear that, that happens immediately. If you've got a bit of a on the onset, that's evidence that the, the vocal folds are probably a little bit tired. So just be aware of those things and don't push through them. Because the more you push through them, the worse they'll get. Just take a mini rest, swallow, have a drink, loosen up a bit, chill, <laughs> and then go back. Great, Ginevra, thank you. Jamie, um, I'd love to add, that's all so useful, Ginevra, and, and completely rings true. Um, I would love to add to that. Um, I, um, I'd like to share with you uh, a mistake that I used to to make, um, which is not recognizing the effect of whole body systemic fatigue on vocal fatigue. And the story I will tell you is I was singing in La Boheme at the Royal Opera House in, in London and training for a strongman competition at the same time, because I am a little bit crazy and I, I like to do things like that. And I, in my mind, I had convinced myself that I had two fuel tanks, one for physical exercise and one for my voice. Um, and this all came to a head, one dress rehearsal, when I had been training all morning and then I, I got to, the, to Covent Garden and I started to sing and I ex was experiencing all of these things that Ginevra uh, has articulated, a delayed onset, inability to sing uh, a pianissimo in particularly in the higher part of my voice and um i was very worried I, I i wasn't ill i'd been sleeping well and i'd been eating well and all that and i realized it's because i was overtrained from another part of my life now i realized straining uh training for a strongman competition is somewhat atypical but stress your uh, stress can be from any element of your life so for example i have a two-month-old daughter now this adds an element of stress and tiredness to my life so i need to factor that into my rehearsing into my practice so it's not just high level athletic tiredness that may be a factor you may just be tired from from your day-to-day -day job you may have had a particularly fun weekend you know you may have gone for a huge countryside walk whatever 
if you are experiencing some sort of unusual or atypical vocal fatigue, consider your systemic tiredness, your systemic stress, because they may very likely be linked. Really fascinating. This is, uh, I'm learning as much as everybody else, stay at home choir members. Um, now we've been a bit, little bit quiet members, so I'm gonna actually start coming to you. Uh, give me a jazz hand if you've got a question in a second, but I'm gonna start, in fact, Mike, you had a really, uh, Mike Newman, you had a great question about breath. Um, I wondered if you wanted to, to ask that. I've lost it in the chat, I'm afraid, but if you want to unmute yourself and, and you can ask Duncan or Ginevra. Whereabouts are you, Mike? You'll need to unmute yourself. Yep, I've done it. Gotcha. gotcha. I am. So um, my question was that I'm, I've been singing for some years in, in choir since I retired. And um, I'm finding that it varies from time to time, but sometimes I can't go more than a couple of bars without feeling I need to take a breath. I'm not sure if I do need or don't, but I feel I do. And so I take one. And I mean, when, when there's a thousand odd singers, it, it's not a big deal. We've been told to, to stagger the breath. But I'm just a bit shocked. I mean, I, I've been talking quite a long sentence there, and I don't think I had to stop for a breath in the middle of it. <laughs> so what's going on? Okay, here's the facts, Mike. From the age of 40, you lose your lung capacity by 1% a year. So it doesn't sound like much, but, uh, you know, as you go through life, it adds up. So you will be losing your, your lung capacity. All right, that's a thing. But again, if you keep singing, you lose it less quickly. The other factor is that your ability to sing long phrases is not purely how much air you have in your lungs. You know, much more significant is how efficient the valve is at the top. Yeah, and if you've got a really efficient valve in your, your larynx, your vocal folds, then you can sing longer phrases, right? Which is why tiny sopranos with tiny lung capacity can still sing the long, long phrases in handle arias because they've got really efficient voices. Um, so if you've got a leaky valve, which you might have if you've got a slightly breathy voice or you've got a tired voice or you, your, um, your voice is, is a little bit inflamed, yeah, then there will be air escaping and the valve is less efficient and you can't get through the long phrases. So that might explain why there's a variability. You know, some days are good and some days are not. Yeah, it might be that, that you've got a bit of a leaky valve on some days. Mike, can I can I give you a, a, a sort of um, visualization that works for me, um, and perhaps it may help you slightly. Um, I was often very self conscious about my running out of breath because I'm I'm quite big. I'm, I'm about six foot four and kind of large, built man, and I would always run out of breath before my colleagues, and I started working with a teacher who explained to me that running out of breath isn't so much a factor of how much air you have, but a factor of the collapsing of your breathing mechanism. And when I sing a particularly long phrase, I imagine a sense of expansion in my entire torso, going all the way into my back, uh, into you know into my the sides of my stomach everything even my throat and I find that simple visualization really does help perhaps it will uh, it, it might be useful for you or any of the members can I add a caveat to that <laughs> that a sense of expansion is soft and gentle and mobile and kind of floaty it's not get out there and hold on for dear life no, not, not, you're absolutely right. Not a gripping expansiveness. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There'll always be someone who misinterprets. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a mobile, gentle thing. Brilliant. Thank you. Ginevra, you were talking about um, a, a, an efficient valve. 
It sounds like the name of name of an album, a prog rock album, doesn't it? Um, I wondered if there are any any exercises that either of you might suggest for because this is this is of course something you know we want our voices to be efficient, we want to be doing things healthily, um, but it's not something you can suddenly go and do a valve exercise, as it were, or is it? Is there something that we can do that will help with with making sure we're doing things efficiently without potentially falling into traps of warm ups that aren't all that useful? Well, the everyone's got different issues yeah some people will be using not enough muscular effort and other people will be using too much muscular effort so a one-size-fits-all exercise is difficult um but the ones that are pretty foolproof are the ones which are on a buzz or a, a hum or through a straw all right and those are we, we call them semi-occluded vocal tract so that means you've got a a partial closure somewhere above the larynx that's just another valve so anything on a v, z, z, v those are all occlusions and also brrr and brrr are, are useful ones too and singing through a straw so those are never going to cause a problem all right they're always useful and they will regulate the amount of effort going into the vocal fold vibration you, it's difficult to push and squeeze and shove when you've got that semi-occlusion. Okay, so that's a very useful thing to do. Um, and then, of course, you have to carry it through into your singing. I mean, you can't go and do a concert singing through a straw. <clears throat> you have to take it into singing text and singing open vowels. So you have to then learn how to transition from one to the other. Yeah, and, and fool your brain into thinking that it's still doing the same as it was. All right, so then you do your and you go from one to the other and you seamlessly join them up and then your vote, your larynx gets into the habit of singing like it did with the occlusion once you've taken it away. So that's one exercise. Um, another one that you can do, which is really useful with um, it's a classic for teenage girls who might have breathy voices, um, but it's also quite useful for older singers when their voices might get a bit breathy. And that's to do a really light glottal click at the beginning. So the kind of click that you have when you go, uh-oh, uh-oh, if you just say that, you feel a little click happening in your throat. That's the vocal folds just coming together just before the air goes through. And because they're coming together before the air goes through, they're coming together, they can only make that click if the, the whole length of the vocal fold is, is together. And it's not a problem, it's not gonna hurt them because it's a very gentle click. But if you then put that at the beginning of a, of a sung sound, e, oh, ah, you can hear that little click at the beginning. Yeah, that means that the vocal fold, because the vocal folds are coming together, that then the vibration is much more likely to be the whole length of the vocal folds and you won't have that breathiness. Yeah. So that's another way. Yeah, the, the semi-occluded vocal tract is a really good way of stopping too much effort going into the sound. And the little glottal click is a very good way of making sure there is enough going into it. It's all a subtle balance. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to throw it back over to you guys, Kathy. You've Kathy Heaton. You've had a good question about uh, fry. Whereabouts are you? I've just written the word fry on my notes. Kathy Heaton. Must be about chips, about? fish and chips. Fish and chips. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> mm. Kathy, you'll need to unmute yourself. I can't find you yet. If you'd like to ask your question. after session a few days oh, got you sorry could you start again kathy we got you a little bit late uh yeah just a question about vocal fry and i've um heard seen and read conflicting advice in that uh some say it, it's, it's a benefit as part of a warm-up exercise but others have said another vocal choir i'm a member of that quite a lot here are members of um say it's actually damaging to your voice and that we shouldn't do it so and i know ginevra said a few days ago in her 
um, fantastic session the other day that it was a benefit. So I just wondered what Duncan, uh, Duncan's views was on the local fry. Just to oh, great question, Kathy. Um, I, I won't lie; it's it's not something I'm particularly. Uh, I, I would happily defer to Ginevra, but um, I use vocal fry as a sort of checkup test. Um, if I can't do it, it means I'm probably a little tired or a little tight or something's not quite right. If my voice, it, it, uh, my healthy voice has the capacity to vocal fry, because I, what I understand in Ginevra, please stop me if I'm wrong, from what I understand is if, if the, chords aren't healthy, you sort of lose the, the ability to do it. So I, I use it as a sort of, uh, okay, I'm good. I, I'm good to sing. I, I, is that, does that sound uh, reasonable? Yeah. To know? It's, it's more to do with the fact that you are able to relax the whole system. And if you can relax the whole system to go down to your lowest possible pitch, which is basically what Fry is, then you know that you haven't got yourself in a tight old tangle. Um, so just fry on its own. Uh, that sound is a really good health check. As Duncan said, it's a great thing to do at the end of a choir rehearsal. Yeah, just come down, uh, slide down and fry. Really, really useful way of cooling your voice down, restoring it to a nice, easy, relaxed state. When fry is a problem is when you can't get rid of it in your speaking voice. So if I talk to you with fry like this, you can hear I've got my normal speaking voice, but I've also got that fry going on over the top. Uh, and in order to do that, I've got chaotic vibration of my vocal folds. All right, now I can do that as, an, as a demonstration because I'm doing it quite quietly. But if I did that loudly, it would actually be potentially quite harmful because I've got more than one vibratory mechanism going on at once, which is why you can hear the one pitch of my speaking voice and you can hear the rattle over the top. So it, from time to time, quietly, it's not a problem. If it's absolutely all through somebody's voice, it's a little bit of an alarm bell, it's things aren't quite right. So you were right on both fronts. It's, it's good and it's bad. <laughs> and to, to address the idea of it as, uh, and I, I've been in choir rehearsals before where I've seen this used as a, as a warm up concept. Could you just, could you clarify that for everybody? Just the sound on its own? Yes, is it a warm up? Not really, it's a warm down. There you go. Um, but <laughs> it's a useful, it, if you come to choir, a bit tight, it's a useful rebalancing. Yeah. Sometimes you need to start an activity by getting rid of all the other things <laughs> that are going on in your body and wiping the slate clean, ready to start the new one. Great. Thank you, Geneva. Clearing, clearing up all of these myths we've heard in our times in choirs. Brilliant. That, really good question, Cathy. Thank you. Um, now, the Oh, bye, Jane. Um, I'm going to come out to the grid. Give us, give us a jazz hand if you have a question. We've got a little bit more time. Give me a jazz hand if you have a question, and I will come to you. I'm going to scroll through a couple of pages. Yeah, in. I see first. Lynn D in my on my screen. Go for it. Waving her hand. Lynn D. Hello. You'll need to just unmute uh, yourself. Right, first. that's me. <laughs> right, thank you. Hi, um, Duncan. I, I had to have ENT surgery uh, just before lockdown, which was a bit of a disaster. Uh, and of course that's affected my voice and, and struggled through, but uh, I have been left with sort of surplus mucus. My daughter recommended using an EpiPot, is what she calls it, but it's actually um, a nasal wash and you use nasal rinse salt. Uh, I've started using it and I can breathe better so I would imagine as I can breathe better, I'll be able to sing better, I hope, uh, because I'm concerned that damage has been done, that I will have to give up my singing. 
So what is your advice on um, the nasal wash uh, bottles or pots? Uh, do you know about them? Yeah, absolutely. Lynn, I'm, I'm sorry you've had a hard time. That's um, unfortunate and, and good luck getting through it. I, I, that must be very stressful. Um, yes, I do know about them and I've used them. Uh, to be honest, they saved me. Um, I was in Australia singing uh, the title role in the opera Don Giovanni. Um, and I did, this was in 2018. And I did the direct flight from London to, to Perth, which is in Western Australia, and then another seven hours from Perth to Sydney. So, you know, quite an epic journey. I mean, I may as well have gone to the moon. Yeah. And I picked up a really nasty bug in the plane. And we had a three week rehearsal process and I really, I wasn't right for the entire process. Uh, some of the things Geneva was, was describing, you know, I had trouble accessing the top of my voice, uh, sometimes a delayed onset and, and various things, but I kind of soldiered on. Um, and I eventually saw an ENT and I was experiencing, uh, because of this infection, I had overnight a sort of nasal drip uh, dripping onto my vocal cords from, from this infection in my, in my nasal cavity. And using one of these nasal douches, they, ca they come in a variety of forms. They're mm. basically all the same sort of saline solution. Uh, completely cleared it up and I was able to go on for o opening night. So they can be useful. Um, in terms of getting rid of mucus, I won't lie, I'm not really <laughs> sure of the effectiveness. Perhaps, Genova, you could chime in there? Well, mucus is only a problem if it's thick and sticky. Mucus is actually your best friend <laughs> the rest of the time. Uh, we need it. We need it to keep healthy. We need it to, to make a sound in the first place. Yeah, Our vocal folds won't make a sound if they're dry. They need to be wet and they're wet. They're moist with mucus. So mucus is great and we like, we like it to be moving around. We like it to be moist and, and uh, mobile. If it's thick and sticky, then that's a problem. And it's thick and sticky if it's either infected or if we're dehydrated. So making sure you drink enough is is a you know important um but you can if it's if it's thick and sticky and you want to flush it away and start again a nasal douche is, is not a problem at all the other thing you can do that is really really helpful and never harmful or hardly ever harmful is steaming yeah so you can fill a bowl with with uh, hot water boiling water and put a towel over your head and stay there for at least five minutes. Now, no, don't put any oils in, just steam. Um, I always have to say, don't be an idiot. It's boiling water. You don't want to tip it in your lap. You don't want to put your nose in it. But um, apart from that, it can't do you any harm. All right, so steam. And what the steam will do is the moisture in the air will help to loosen any thick and claggy mucus that you've got. Yeah. So you may find that five minutes of steaming and you need to have a box of tissues nearby because you, you start to run and stream and, and the rest of it. And one more really good way to stimulate the production of runny, plenty of runny mucus is to get out in the cold air. Exercise outdoors yeah, is really, really good for you because in the winter, when we're living in a heated environment and it's dry, yeah, it's, we were much more prone to infections and our mucus will dry out. Get out and spend an hour a day walking or go for a run or something. Your nose will pour. Yep, but it's great. And you, you flush out any problems that might want to want to go and live in there. We love our, our <laughs> mucus conversations in Stone Cry. I think that's probably the fourth or fifth one we've had, though definitely the most enlightening. Usually me and Tori just say, we're not a doctor, we can't talk about this. <laughs> Good luck with your um, good luck with everything. I hope I hope that helps. That, Thank you. Uh, amazing. I've had lots of problems. Uh, I've had to have um, chemo and, and everything, which has affected my jaw. I've got sensory, and then I ended up with a, a nasal ulcer, and that's what the surgery was for. Um, it, it's it's just been a night, and uh, on the verge of am I. Uh, can, well, I have to give up singing. I, I'm, I've started looking at 
um, Caledonia be my, my swan song, as it were, because it's been tough. But uh, uh, this has helped. But I was a bit concerned without proper um, uh, professional advice on the nasal wash, whether I could cause more harm um, and, and if, if it was good to use. It certainly feels good because it clears uh, some of the, the, the sort of tough stuff for me and I can breathe better uh, but um, it's uh, it's just been a health issue uh, and uh, it's affected my singing uh, and I love singing um, it's uh, I'm not professional I'm useless I don't read music I need other people next to me to dig me in the ribs when I go up down or otherwise I uh, kind of missing them um, for doing this sort of single thing. That's been really tough. Uh, and, and these have been amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie, Tori, and, and yourselves. When I get this, I've been writing like crazy. I've got so many notes now, Geneva, <laughs> from your last uh, as well. I've got so many notes. I'll be working my way through. But this one has uh, been in the background a wee bit. Uh, and thanks very much for that. And the other thing is I've got... Actually, at long last, got an appointment tomorrow for the follow-up to the, the hospital appointment, which I couldn't have before because of the COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, you've given me questions to ask tomorrow uh, with regards to recovery because it's been a bit slow. So amazing. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. All the best. Um, Jamie? Yes. I've been wanting to answer a question from Patty Austin this whole time. Can I quickly touch on it? Of course, of course. Um, Patty Austin. Uh... Oh, we've lost you, Duncan. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I, I stopped holding the paper, <laughs> of course. Um, Patty, dairy and chocolate, please say they help our voices. Um, I won't say they help your voice. But you need not fear dairy products. There's, since we were since we we're on this lovely mucus trail, um, the general myth is that uh, milk and dairy products create phlegm or mucus in the vocal cords. This is not true, and we know it fairly conclusively. There may be a sense of thickness or phlegminess or this sort of sensation of maybe even difficulty swallowing after consuming or particularly drinking milk. This is because milk is an emulsion. It's fat droplets, droplets suspended in a, in a liquid solution. So it can sort of leave a, a feeling of residue. But this is quite a different thing to creating mucus in the throat. So that's a little bit of a myth I thought I would help debunk for you guys. And just so you know, um, the same effect has also been seen in milk type replacements. You probably know the endless array of soy milk, almond milk, whatever, walnut milk, whatever you want. Um, these have also been shown in trials to create that same viscous, phlegmy feeling. So just so you know, you know, if you opt for a, you know, a soy milk latte because you have to sing today, there really is no evidence that you're um, doing anything to uh, get rid of that feeling. So if you do enjoy, I'm not, you know, I always say, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I haven't just bought a dairy farm or invested my life savings in Cravendale stock or anything like that. I'm not making a case for dairy, but if you do enjoy it, you need not avoid it simply because you're a singer. And I, I have, Geneva and I have sort of this mutual desire to reduce the potential neuroses of singers and you know with cold and flus and jet lag and now coronavirus and all sorts of things um i always say we've got enough things to worry about do we really need more reasons to be neurotic so enjoy your dairy enjoy your chocolate patty you'll be absolutely fine I think lots of us enjoyed hearing that, <laughs> for sure. It's tight, Certainly yeah. during lockdown. Wonderful news, yeah. Brilliant. This, this is all all really fantastic. So thank you, thank you so much for all of these brilliant questions, and and lovely to see lots of lots of support as well in in the chat. So um, we've got 
uh, we've got a few minutes left. Let's see if we can um, get get. Let's go for some really rapid fire questions before we wrap up. Everybody, I'm gonna give it, give me a jazz hand if you have a question. I can't get to everyone, but we will do what we can. Let's go. Uh, is that Elaine Lentz? Hello, Elaine. You'll need to just click the end. Hi. Yes. Um, my question is, is it safe to sing when you have a cold or not? Um, it depends what your symptoms are. If your speaking voice is affected and is a bit husky or hoarse, um, then probably not. Yeah. And you should you should limit your voice use if if your larynx is affected. If all you've got is a load of snot and you're just a bit uncomfortable, <laughs> then you can sing. It's that yeah. mucus again. <laughs> yeah, it's that mucus again. Um, if you've got a sore throat, yeah, mm. if your throat hurts when you swallow, that means that it's the pharynx that is that is inflamed and that is not actually anywhere near your, your vocal folds. So pain on swallowing is really unpleasant, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't sing. So tonsillitis, for example, you can sing through tonsillitis. It's just uncomfortable and unpleasant, but you're not going to damage yourself. The only time when you shouldn't sing is if your vocal folds themselves are, are affected, if they, if they are um, sore. And that you, I say sore, you won't feel the sore. You don't have any sensation on your vocal folds. What you will be aware of is a husky or croaky or breathy sound. And if your speaking voice quality has changed, then that's your warning. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ginevra. Let's keep going. Let's see if we can get one more, two one more thing. More. <laughs> Just on. That if you're ill and you're tired, we are back to the systemic thing. Yeah. So if you're ill and you're tired, you won't be doing it, your job as well. Yeah. And you're more likely to then run into problems if you are pushing yourself. But that is the same for any activity, whether it's singing or, you know, whatever it is. Great. Thank you. Let's see if we can do rapid fire. We've probably got time for one, maybe two more. Kay. Hi, Kay. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my voice ripped on the high note as well as lower. But lower one is quite natural. But when, well, after my com comfortable note, when I got to very before I got to high uh, about E, and then my uh, voice flips and then breaks and I cannot sustain the smooth one note. And I can I can go to F or G fine, but just about E, I just break. Is that normal or is that a common or what can I do with it? It's it's it is normal but you you can get around it you should should be able to get around it i would suggest doing exercises that come from above down through that area so do some very gentle glides oh hey oh coming down from the top end of your voice yeah through that through that that kind of bit that's a bit clunky if you take the weight of your lower voice up through it it's going to be more difficult. Yeah, but there will always be a gear change there. There's always going to be a bit of your voice that is not quite as good as the rest. There'll be one note that's a little bit not so brilliant, but you can get around it by by sort of just just shifting the revs, you know, like a gear change in a car. So yeah, it kind of makes sense because once I get to the higher note and I can come back, come down fine. But when very often the one of the part in Caledonia, you, you go from the lower one to the E and then I croak. So, so then you have to pretend you're going to the note above it. Hmm. Yep, you have to go to sing as if you were singing a higher note, as if you weren't going to sing a note that you know will come out comfortably. Yeah, and then your whole mechanism will find its way into that place that is that is easier for the high notes. 
Okay, I, I practice that. Great, right. okay. fantastic. Thanks, Kay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of our session today. Um, time just completely flies, doesn't it, when you're talking about mucus. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been really fun, hugely informative. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I know I certainly have. Um, I do love our stay at home choir little geek out moments. Um, Ginevra, Duncan, thank you so, so much for a fantastic session. I know this is enormously valuable to, to all of us. So thank you. Um, we would love to have you back at some point. Um, I'd love you to, to give a little shout out to your little organization. Um, if people want to go and read more or get in touch with you, where should they go? Well, we've got each of us has got our own website with a lot of information so if you look up duncan rock nutrition you get duncan's amazing website and you get lots and lots of free stuff blogs fabulous research articles um i mean he's just giving it all away it's it's very very useful um go to my website put my name into google you'll find my website again there's loads of stuff on there um and i've got youtube films you can look at which with little hints and guides about about getting the most out of your voice um, if you're interested in training further to help people with their voices um, and if you're looking at vocal health then we've set up a training scheme called vocal health first aid and this is um, really designed for anybody who's working with voices um, and it's it's quite a uh, an easy online platform to go through. Uh, it's great fun training. Um, look it up on vo on um, vocal health education. And there's a Facebook group, Facebook page. There's um, oh we're doing all the sort of Twitter and Instagram and um, all of those things as well. But. <laughs> Look up vocal health education and you'll find us and then you can find out more about our training schemes. Fantastic. Duncan, do you want to add anything? You have to unmute yourself, love. No, just thank you so much for having us. It was a real pleasure. Um, and I, I just, I'd invite you, um, I realise there's, there's so many fantastic questions which we couldn't touch on. Um, as Ginevra mentioned, uh, I would invite you to go to my website. I've put it in the chat. It's um, www.duncanrocknutrition.com. If you just write Duncan Rock Nutrition, it'll come up. And I, I do have a ton of free content on there, which actually would answer many of the questions that have been put into the chat box. But also, to be honest, you know, as you can probably tell, Geneva and I are, are nerds for this kind of stuff. So if there's anything particular you'd like me to, to ask me, just send me an email there's a uh, the contact details are all on my website and also i i love to take requests so if you have a particular um myth you'd like addressed or a particular question i would love to know um what what you'd like addressed and i i will often write articles or make videos in response to, to questions from people um and I, I i welcome them with open arms so please get in touch if you're interested Fantastic. Yeah, anyway, stay in touch. Susie, thank you. For, uh, Susie Lapwood, thank you for putting all of those links in the chat. Really, really helpful. Um, now, the only thing that is left to do is the usual thanks and goodbye in typical stay at home choir fashion. You know how it goes, everybody. Stick it on grid view. Thank you, Ginevra. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us, everybody. See you all soon. Thank you. That was Bruce, wasn't it? <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Awesome. We're allowed to get through. Bye. <laughs>